Um, so I'm going to talk about the League of Nations minority petition procedure um, as a site of struggle between competing justice projects. Um, I don't know if people actually know anything about the um, League of Nations minority supervision program, so I've actually given, um, kind of set out uh, enough details that, that you will be able to understand it, so bear with me if this is stuff that you already know. Um, so the 1919 Paris Peace Conference following the Great War finalized the dismantling uh, of Europe's four empires and established the new Europe in which the nation state became the normative political unit. Of the 100, 000, 100 million people previously inhabiting imperial territory, about 25 million of them found themselves uh, either designated as minorities or simply others in somebody else's nation state. The Committee on New States at the Paris Peace Conference, fearing that, um, fearing that persecuted minorities wouldn't easily be able to settle down to become the loyal citizens of their new country and might even become a, a, a pretext for interstate conflict, compelled certain states, about 15 of them by 1924, um, there's a kind of map of them, so they're on the, the sort of eastern periphery uh, of Europe, but from mostly former um, Habsburg and uh, Ottoman territories, to sign minorities' treaties or agreements as the price of international recognition. And these treaties guaranteed to persons belonging to minorities of race, language, uh, or religion full civil and political rights and certain special rights regarding the use of language in schools, courtrooms, and also the creation of their own um, civic and charitable institutions. So this minority petition procedure, uh, established in 1920, allowed anybody to submit a communication drawing the League's attention to an alleged infraction of, of a minorities' treaties. And this was seen as an unprecedented uh, intervention in international relations, and it created a new political field. Now, much of the scholarship tends to assess the procedure normatively in terms of its success and failure, and who supported and who undermined it. But I want to look at it, really, uh, as a kind of engagement between different parties, and look at the different ways that the parties uh, using the, the, the process um, uh, are using it for their particular purposes. And I'm looking at the case of Macedonia. And I think that there are several different justice projects that are at play at this, um, at, at, at the site of the petition process. And first I think we have to, to um, look at the Victor's project, which really articulated the um, new political and legal order of the Versailles treaties. Um, which was trying to uh, establish a peaceful, post-war, post-imperial new Europe of nation states in which um, those previous nationalities um, come to see themselves as minorities, as, as minority citizens within somebody else's nation state. So the architecture uh, of the uh, petition process is meant to serve uh, those ends. Advocates of a second justice project, which is actually internally splintered and evolving over time, resisted that minoritization and the domestication that it implied. And they used the procedure to continue a second unfinished project for nationhood, demanding their right to self-determination and the recognition of Macedonia in some form, whether autonomous or independent, and the revision of unjust borders. So Keith has already alluded to, to some of the claims being made um, for, this, for this project. So these are the kind of two major um, projects that are uh, clashing uh, uh, and competing, um, but not very equally uh, posed against each other. But there are three other categories of actors who I think are important to um, the story and to take account of. First of all, the, that category of minority states, the 
the states which had uh, accepted these uh, agreements. They did so under duress. They saw them in a, as an unwelcome infringement on their sovereignty, something which relegated them to a kind of humiliating second-class status within the League. They didn't have one single approach to minorities, but for all of them, the main goal was to uh, consolidate their own authority, uh, their, their new territory, their new uh, nation state, while limiting the League's oversight in their internal affairs. And this is an ongoing theme for them. Second, I think, an important sort of um, category uh, of actors, again, quite internally diverse, uh, would be um, private organizations, some of them uh, internationalists, some of them from the old nationalities of the uh, imperial system, some quite progressive, like Women's and International League of Peace and Freedom, the Union of League of Nations Societies, and even uh, including revisionist states like Bulgaria and uh, Germany, um, who are often arguing that um, minority protections and rights um, are not just a necessary evil, but actually a good thing, and that the, the, the system ought to actually be expanded to all countries to get uh, rid of the issue of the, the inequality between states and to really give uh, a kind of protection uh, for um, minorities living elsewhere than these minority states. And then finally, I wanted to mention um, forgot about this picture, but that's what it used to look like. That's the League, that's the Palais Wilson, um, which, which was the original seat of the League, now the Center of Human Rights. Okay, these are different projects. I, I have to mention the uh, League Secretariat, uh, particularly the, the Minorities and Administrative Commission section, uh, usually abbreviated to the Minority Section, which was uh, a crucial actor um, which really can be seen as involved in a justice project of building internationality, of securing the conditions for the peace. So this sort of idealism uh, of the, the bureaucrats at this moment, I think, is quite uh, noticeable. Uh, and this was the group which actually was the first point of port of call for minorities issues. It took care of the everyday work of minority supervision. Um, and became very um, acknowledged for their expertise and their negotiating s skills, advising states, even though states officially took uh, petitions. So the struggle over what constituted a just solution to the minority's problem uh, or question um, and the shifting balance of power between these different projects um, was something which you can see enunciated not only in the content of petitions and in the uh, discourse around it, for example, the bureaucratic evaluation, the state's response, but in the very technologies of procedure and debates about procedure within the League's bureaucratic space. So around um, what constituted a petition, on the conditions of receivability for petitions, and how we should interpret um, uh, those conditions in relation to particular petitions, on rules concerning the distribution of files. So these sort of nitty gritty uh, issues of, of procedure, I think are something that, that we need to look at. So let me make a methodological parenthesis. So when I first entered the League uh, of Archives in 1996, and I started looking at the files related to um, Les Minorités Bulgares, or La Situation uh, Macedoine. The letters to the League of Nations were far from the first documents that I encountered, but as they came to the surface now and then, um, mm. it was, I had the feeling of immediacy, of, of, of hearing the voices or, or reading the words of particular people, particular associations. Um, they arrived in different forms and shapes, letters, telegrams, formal communications from annual congresses, but they appealed, claimed, made arguments, uh, and described a desired future. Their stories, their rhetorics, the details of their appeals and claims, 
fascinated me. So I just wanted to have an excuse to give you a, a sense of some of the content, because otherwise um, we won't get a chance. But, and again, from early on, um, there's, there's, a, there's a, a kind of idealism uh, that there is a possibility of things changing. Um, first, we have a telegram from Macedonian stu students from the University of Geneva. Um, a kind of very broad kind of congratulations and we hope that you won't forget uh, about uh, Macedonia and its destiny, reminding you that the population wasn't consulted on its fate despite the principle of self-determination. This is the second one, very similar, again kind of um, wanting to believe that somehow the, the League of Nations is going to be able to stand above that territorial settlement um, to uh, actually avert the catastrophe of the actual settlement and, and change it. Okay. We've, we've lost confidence in Versailles, but we haven't yet lost confidence in the League of Nations. Uh, and this one from Steelton, Pennsylvania, from the diaspora in the USA, um, expressing uh, this vision of, uh, of Macedonia as uh, Macedonia for the Macedonians of all nationalities and religions, um, beginning to protest uh, at the unjust uh, dividing of Macedonia between the three different countries uh, and asking for the creation of an autonomous Macedonia under the League protection. Okay. Um, this is a, a later one. I think one, one thing that intrigued me here is the, the way that there's a kind of renomination, the Secretary of the League of Oppressed Peoples uh, of the World in this, in this uh, one coming from the Macedonian Political Association. And also the form. We're, we're seeing uh, a kind of um, uh, the resolution, the, the, the uh, you know, the collective view uh, of given, given this, given that, given the other, the solution will be a Balkan federation, okay, which, which they would like. And, and I think I'm also quite um, interested in the official stamps, the letterheads, the notarizations, uh, which come to uh, mark and authorize uh, this collective voice. Equally fascinating to me, to the, to the content, um, were the underlinings in blue pencil on the typed text, the scrawled notes in the margins, the long commentaries typed or handwritten onto pages appended to the circulating file. Okay, and this one is um, one I'm going to return to later, but I'll let you have a look at it. And we've um, highlighted in, in yellow uh, the bits that were actually indeed underlined on, on the petition in the file. So from these underlining scrawls and commentaries <clears throat> from the officials, I learned that this letter probably was not intended as a petition, so that merely a letter to the author acknowledging a receipt should be sent, or that that letter, treated as a petition this time, failed to fulfill the second condition of receivability. <clears throat> Yet, in addition to that standard letter to the author acknowledge, uh, acknowledging receipt, uh, the file would be passed along to some colleague in some other section who might be interested. So through the palimpsest of each file, which contained that letter which might become a petition, um, which prompted file, scribbling, long memoranda, copies of acknowledgement, uh, cover files when the, league was uh, when the file was forwarded, <clears throat> I began to discern a long-winded, often intense, yet typically courteous dialogue between secretariat bureaucrats as they thrashed out what the communication was. Was it a petition? Whether it met the, met the requirements for receivability and where it should go next? So it was easy to forget that I, a scholar reading 
the files in 1996, was seeing traces of this intense talk around a petition of which the author actually saw nothing. And so I want to think about this break. This is more of the, I'll let you read that. Uh, the voluminous uh, commentary that was, that was generated. But I want to think about this break in the chain of communication, this exclusion, its meaning, its effects, its violence. The author sent in a petition by post, received a letter confirming receipt, and then in most cases heard nothing ever again. And what about further up the League's secretariat organizational hierarchy and sideways to other sections, to commissions, diplomats? Who got to see his eloquent complaint and who did not? So inspired by Sarah Green and some of the work she's doing on um, connections and disconnections uh, in the chain of communication, I want to think about those connections and disconnections which the petition triggers. A petition instigated a process, generated relationships, traveled where its author or authors could not go. And that process, those relationships, that field of inclusion and exclusion were shaped by ostensibly technical and administrative rules of procedure. So in this presentation, I want to broaden my object to pay attention not only to what petitions claimed, uh, but also to look at that procedure, how it was interpreted and how it was struggled over. So I'll be looking at the procedure for receivability, the conditions a petition had to fulfill in order to be seen and heard, um, and I'll also look more briefly at the struggle over rules uh, of the paths of circulation which a petition uh, could travel within the League institution, who, which determined who could see it and who could not. Okay, so again, thinking about the general context of this, um, this process, earlier treaties uh, had included protections for religious communities, but the Paris Peace Treaties were the first to designate minorities as a matter of international concern, which meant that it was the international community, incipient, incipient as it was, um, and not a great power or kin state who was responsible to guarantee these. So they had to come up with some kind of mechanism uh, to carry this out. Uh, so a committee of the League Council uh, came up with a, uh, a proposal which was adopted, and this was to treat the minorities petition process um, as something in which anyone could submit a communication to draw the, attentions league, uh, the League's attention to this infraction. But it was to be treated as information, pure and simple, rather than a complaint requiring uh, a reply. The petitioner was not a party to a dialogue, a negotiation, or an arbitration. He or she had no legal standing or right to be recognized as interlocutor. Okay, so exactly kind of what you're referring to. But it seems to me this is a really, something very particular um, uh, related to this moment. It's, it's um, this formulation which is both democratizing and yet de-democratizing, opens, opens it up to um, uh, individuals and groups. Um, at the same time, it's very technicizing. It's, it's a dramatic change in the kind of structure of peti petitioning. Um, it invoked and performed the legitimacy and power of the new international legal and political order while parading as a neutral technique. It placed the terms of that order beyond discussion. The territorial settlement is finalized, we're not even going to talk about it, this is not relevant. And I think it changed the relation, the terms of engagement between petitioner and, and authority. I think petitioners continued to address the League of Nations much as they had addressed consuls, heads of states, perhaps 
even the, the sultan as the, the supreme arbiter of justice, okay, you have these phrase, but there was no recognition uh, returning back to the petitioner. So I think there's something that I'm still trying to get my, get my head around and, and understand, which is quite new and for me rather, um, rather violent, rather ominous about this, um, this new uh, way of dealing with petitioners and their grievances only in terms of information. So the moment of the procedure that was most critical for petitioners was the moment of the petition's reception. Um, and these conditions of receivability were what the uh, section, minority section, worked with when um, uh, a petition arrived. They were already in use, uh, really right from the very beginning. They weren't officially uh, accepted until 1923, but uh, I think they're quite interesting. And I think the, the first one, which um, I'm only kind of recently becoming uh, aware of how important that was in deciding whether something was a petition or not, uh, was really in accordance with uh, what I've just said about the view that the procedure was uh, a technical, technical means of deciding, of, of getting information on possible violations, so that a petition must have in view the protection of minorities in accordance with the treaties. Okay? Um, second, they can't be submitted in the form of a request for severance of political relations uh, between the minority in question and the state in which it forms part, which is a which is a anti-separatist um, uh, condition. They have to be authenticated. In fact, uh, it, it's, it's extremely rare to find a petition that doesn't have uh, a signature and address on it. Um, number four, must abstain from violent language. Uh, and this is the one I'm going to talk about a little bit more in a minute. Um, and, and the fifth one is it can't uh, be a repeat petition. Okay. Now, Before I talk a little bit about violent language, and I can see my time is going, um, let me just say that if we think about petitions as the material manifestation of claims, um, we can think of them as performative. We can think of them as, as having effects. Um, having effects for those who wrote them and effects for those who read them, whether or not they achieved um, their explicit goal. And it was very clear that diplomats in the League of Nations feared petitions, championed them, or tried to uh, control their circulation uh, within the space of the League. And so one of the kind of areas of the procedure that um, got uh, quite a lot of attention was um, how widely within the, the league the, the, the petition making accusations of a government could be distributed. So this was one of the, the kind of um, struggles uh, at, in the early days, leagues, uh, in the early day, days, petitions that were receivable uh, would immediately be sent out to, in fact, every single member uh, of the League of Nations. Okay. And then the minority, several of the minority states objected to this. They said a lot of these petitions are made simply for the purposes of propaganda. It's taking us far too long to answer uh, back to them. Uh, we need to restrict the uh, circulation. And they got it uh, reduced only to members of council, which was a much smaller uh, number. So, so that, that's all I want to say about that, but that was a very important kind of way in which the minority states tried to limit um, their exposure to uh, propaganda, to insult, to what they considered to be um, uh, calumny, um, to limit it to, to a much smaller number of people. Okay, I want to go now to this um, very, very intriguing 
condition number four, that, that petitions must um, refrain from violent language. And this was, uh, this was the condition which intrigued me both because I didn't really understand what it meant, but also because it was in fact the, um, the condition that was most cited as the reason to refuse the petitions which were being sent in to the league. Um, okay, this is the minority section who would have been dealing with the, the um, all, all the different petitions that were coming in. Uh, just to say here that we're dealing with a very small section. The men are the officials, the, the women are the stenographers, I'm afraid. So we have this sort of gender um, division. Okay. That's the... Eric Drummond, who is the uh, Secretary General. Sorry, I just want to show you some of these pictures. The council, <coughs> that would be the, the group that would be looking at the uh, receivable petitions. There we go again. Okay, and I'll come back. Yeah, I'll stay there. Okay. Um, so in, in trying to understand uh, why the uh, condition to abstain from violent language was something which was so kind of resonant and so important. Um, I began to study really discourse, uh, political dis discourse uh, in a longer term period and discovered that there was uh, a kind of distinction understood between la langue cultivée cultivated language and the vulgar language. And using cultivated language was seen to be um, a kind of sign of rationality, uh, of authority, uh, and groups which used the vulgar language were not considered to be uh, authoritative uh, and powerful. So that was one of the issues. But, let's see if I can go back, yeah. The, the explicit reason um, that uh, by that language was uh, argued against in the beginning was that it, it was really about malicious propaganda, um, that the uh, violent language would be used to uh, throw discredit uh, upon a state. But I really felt that this um, expressed deeper anxieties about disorder and the transformative um, potential of, of popular um, energies. Okay. But we could see, we could see in the, in the league, in the um, relationships between states, that um, they, they manage their relationships with each other through uh, sort of expert uh, use of cultivated language so that when they expressed um, disputes with each other, it tended to be done uh, in a very um, elegant and um, uh, in an elegant way, and there would be indirection when criticism was used. And when a, uh, a delegate transgressed this code, uh, it was seen as something very shocking. And I found this example uh, of a Bulgarian delegate who is accusing Greece uh, of uh, atrocities uh, and using a kind of language that, in fact, we find in petitions, but this was seen as a, as a very shocking thing. Okay, so I want to um, just very quickly talk about this petition. Okay, this petition, which is sent in uh, by the president of the uh, L'Union des Femmes Macedoines. This is um, attached. This is attached to the resolution voted at their Congress. Um, and the phrases, as I've said, marked in um, in, in yellow in this case, uh, were were done by the um, minority section official William O'Sullivan Maloney. Um, as he assessed whether the, the, the petition met the conditions of receivability. Uh, and 
Okay, that's the, the translation. So you can see that the kind of uh, things that were uh, being treated as violent language uh, were you know, simply to accuse the state of treating people as slaves, of enjoying the martyrdom uh, uh, of people, um, describing them as uh, carrying out a medieval regime. So really, it's, it's sort of issues of, of insult uh, to, to the authority. So here's what Maloney writes. He said, the language the violence of the language of the resolution communicated to us by the petitioners is such that its communication to the Greek government for observations could not be envisaged. I've therefore concluded that the petition doesn't meet the fourth condition of receivability. And under those conditions, it's not even necessary to uh, apply the other conditions uh, to, to, to see whether they would be, would be met. So it, it seemed to be kind of one more uh, bit of evidence that these conditions of receivability, the, this um, prohibition of violent language was um, a really the most fundamental uh, issue. And I wanted to say that it, this, this issue of petitions and, and writing petitions in a way that they might be heard was something which mobilized not just the petitioners, but also um, allies uh, and friends uh, in other places. So we have here the Women's League of International, uh, Women's International League of Peace and Freedom, who had itself been involved in uh, kind of minorities uh, issues, and Mary Sheepshanks, who is the secretary of Wilf uh, in this period, uh, writes a letter to uh, the president of uh, another women's association in Bulgaria and basically gives advice about how these petitions ought to be uh, written in order that they might be uh, accepted. And she basically tells them uh, that they have to adopt this moderate language which is uh, demanded uh, in order to uh, be able to be heard. So for her, uh, the idea is that you know, the, the, the tactic must be, the strategy must be to accept the terms uh, uh, of writing, uh, the terms of the peace treaties um, in order to um, uh, be able to get one's petition heard and go on to the next level. But I wanted to mention that, that this restriction on language um, had uh, effects, had repercussions in the minority section itself. There is a kind of bureaucratic contestation which develops um, in 1927 uh, by a Persian um, official who says we're being much too harsh. Uh, and much too restrictive in our uh, reading of these uh, petitions. We are, we are perhaps reading other things into things like ignorance of the language or different temperaments, different uh, mentalities and, and, and temperaments, the psychological factor, there are actually injustices and extortions going on, um, and ways of speaking words and even written texts do actually correspond to events. So he's one of the few that uh, is really recognizing that in order to talk about violence, one has to uh, talk about actual violent events in the world, one has to use some of these um, kinds of de descriptions, uh, and that this needs to be something which is accepted and, and can be um, dealt with within the procedure. Okay, so that's what I wanted to, to, to go over, give, give you some of these examples, um, and uh, I'll stop there. Okay, thank you.